I'm Hannah. I'm a senior at Mountain View High School, and you're listening to the West Ada Podcast. And when you understand how these work in the brain, we as parents ask ourselves, why does my kid spend five hours a day on social media? And as a neurologist, my response is, I wonder why these kids don't spend 24 hours a day because <laughs> that's that's the draw. The like, reward, yeah. yeah we're sure, ask, we're sure. asking ourselves the wrong question. Why are they spending so much time? Where I'm saying, why aren't they spending all their time? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. And I'm going to be just honest. I'm, I'm kind of feeling the weight of the conversation we just had, but I think this is one of the most important conversations we've had this year. Absolutely. Really you took do. the words right out of my mouth. Usually yeah. we're like, I'm so excited. This is great. <laughs> this is imperative information that you have as a parent, not the most exciting, um, but also very informative. A hundred percent. And yeah. important, hugely important. Massively important. And, and we're, we're joined today by a couple of guests. Dr. John Condy is uh, the, uh, a child neurologist at St. Luke's. Uh, and so he, he talks very eloquently about uh, what's happening in our kids' brains, our prefrontal frontal cortexes, all of those things, and then another yeah, guest, of, Officer Gomez. Yeah, yeah, Officer Gomez, if you, as parents, if you are on social media in any way, Facebook particularly, follow Officer Gomez. He, I've been following him for years, and he gives you so many important rules and tips and things that are currently going on and what teenagers are seeing. Um, just both invaluable resources to kind of understand like the, the medical side, side behind things, it yeah. and the social yeah. side with yeah. social media so it's a it's a good conversation um that you really need to hear well i'm glad you're here uh buckle up here's the conversation Guys, thank you so much uh, for being here. If you don't mind, let's just start a little bit with background a little bit. Dr. John Condé, I think you moved here from Phoenix. Uh, you're, a, you're a child neurologist. Can you just briefly give us your background? Sure. Uh, my background is a little unusual. Um, so I, I went into pediatrics not knowing what kind of pediatrician I was going to be. And sure. then I uh, quickly found out that the, the study of neurology was keeping me interested because of its complexity. And, um, and to be honest... Pediatric neurologists are all, always just a little on the odd side, and <laughs> I am also we're going to fit in great, yeah, on the great. odd side. So <laughs> I realized that I'd found my cohort, um, and then I, I I did my training in pediatrics, and then went to Chicago at the Northwestern Children's Memorial uh, Program to do my training in neurology, child neurology. Okay, okay. So the way that that works there is the first three years of the training you're exposed to and you get enough clinical experience to sit for your general child neurology boards. Okay. 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 So I was, I was, I was, uh, immersed in just your typical general child neurology programs for the first three years. I got epilepsy and muscular dystrophies and Tourette syndrome, um, and multiple sclerosis and, sure. and these things that we see. And, uh, one thing I found really quickly is that I was drawn to the acuity of neurocritical care. Okay. So traumatic brain injury and stroke and bacterial meningitis and et cetera, hemorrhage and things like that. Things where days to minutes can make the difference between a good outcome and a catastrophic outcome. Okay. Uh, and at the time, there was no neurocritical care training program anywhere for pediatrics. It was all adult. And my, my mentor, who is currently the chair of pediatric in Seattle, started one. And um, so I stuck around for an extra year, and I was actually the first pediatric neurologist who became board certified in pediatric neurocritical care in the country. That was that's, oh. so. That's my one one claim to fame. That's yeah. pretty darn cool. <laughs> Holy cow! Um, and then, uh, and ob obviously, you need to move to a center where there's a lot of business, for the mm -hmm. lack of a better word. To support such a thing, and that came with Phoenix because oh, Phoenix has okay. a okay. massive children's hospital. Uh, I think it's like the fourth or fifth largest in the country in regards to total number of beds. And uh, I got hired on right out of training to do solely pediatric critical care. So I lived in the ICU and trauma base. I never, never I can't saw. Imagine, holy cow! Ooh. Yeah, that's that's intense, man. Yeah, intense is is a good way to describe it. I can't imagine. Um, Work widow is a way that my wife would describe it. <laughs> sure. And uh, and it was intense and it was long and uh, it was I quite enjoyed it. But then the kids came and I and the longing to be more with my family came and mm. the two are not compatible with each other. So sure. after what five years, six years, we made the decision. It was time to 
change. And this job opened up in Boise at St. Luke's. And I actually know personally one of the my colleagues here. We used to wakeboard together. I, and so I heard about the work-life balance. And so I came back and now I'm a practicing general pediatric neurologist again. But I still uh, have an emphasis on the on the ICUs uh, uh, in those things. So excited to pick your brain and, and yeah. what's happening with our children's brains. So super excited to have have you here. Yeah, yeah. Well, and Officer Gomez. I mean, I know you 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 were you've been an SRO for 19, 20 years at least, something like that. Yeah, I mean, a while, right? Yeah, oh, well, it seems that long. I've, <laughs> I've, I've been an SRO now eleven years. Eleven years. Sorry, I gave you eight years. You should. You that, didn't that's deserve. What it feels that long. <laughs> <laughs> it feels that long. Well, and working you, with teenagers. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and you and you were in West Ada for a long time. You were at Idaho City now, correct? So, so I'm currently the SRO Idaho City Schools, which is K through 12, 300 students. It's a big change from Mountain View, 2,300 students. Right. Oh, right. But I started right. my life off as an engineer at Micron. So I have a bachelor degree in electronics engineering technology. And oh. then I switched to law enforcement at age 36. So, so one day you're just there at Micron doing your thing and you're like, you know what I would like to do? I would like to go be a deputy and work with some teenagers. I think I was with my wife at home in Meridian and I saw an advertisement for Meridian Police. I said, honey, are you ready to be broke again? <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> it took her about three days to answer yeah. me. And then I, I was on patrol for Meridian for three years. Then they asked me to be an SRO at Lewis and Clark. Okay. And when I went to Lewis and Clark, my job is to keep the kids safe and build relationships. When I built relationships, I realized that everything they did was on social media. So it was on social media first, then at the school. Right. So I made some fake accounts to learn social media. And I made a fake account of the kids at, the, at my own school. They all friended me without even asking me who I was. Oh, wow. And it's through those fake accounts. You know, I learned what the students were about, but I also quickly had adult predators contacting me, asking to meet up. Mm -hmm. So I said, sure, let's meet up. And we did. And we ended up arresting lots of people here in Meridian that came thinking they were going to have sex with 13-year-old boys and girls. And through doing search warrants on their computers and seeing what they were doing, I learned about all that, and I started sharing that with parents on my Facebook page. I've been following you, I think, since <laughs> very early on. And I'll yeah. tell you what, it's, yeah. it's an eye-opening education, that's for sure. Yep, and through that Facebook page, I mean, I've, I have like 245,000 people now that are following me. It is its own information source. So I get parents from all over the world who will contact me and say, have you seen this? Have you seen that? And a lot of times I've seen it at my own school where I'm at, but sometimes I haven't. So then I share it, and I talk with people, and... These problems are worldwide. The same thing that happens here in Idaho City and Meridian happens in Australia. It happens in the UK, happens everywhere. And, you know, the the kids use Wi-Fi. They're all equal and the predators are all equal as well. And they Uh, share just as much information as the kids do. So I try and share all that and help parents catch up a little bit to their kids on social media. Wow. Okay, I I need to um, keep my professional hat and my mom hat balanced here because these conversations often make me want to just jump up and go run home and get my kids and then move off grid and get out of society, right? But that's not very rational. So hopefully through this conversation today, we'll be able to give some parents the knowledge and the tools that that we all need to, to raise our kids well and make informed decisions before we give them phones in their hand where they can access all this, right? Yes. And there's plenty of parents that do just fine with social media in their house. You just yeah. it's a have to be doing present. it. Yeah. Well, I want to talk predators in just a second, but I think maybe maybe a good starting point, Dr. Condi, if you don't mind, can you describe, and, and I shouldn't say talk to me like a fifth grader, but talk to me like a fifth grader, what's, what's happening to our child's, our children's brains uh, from a neurological standpoint uh, with these screens we're all holding? Yeah, that's going to depend on what literature you read, actually. Um, and that's one thing that I, I feel for it because it can be very confusing because depending on who you talk to, um, what side of the aisle you're on as far as whether this is good or bad, there is ample amount of research and literature out there to support your side. Right. So, um, and there's a reason for that, and I can talk about that. But uh, there's for, for parents and administrators who – or maybe want to believe that this is good for their kids or good for their schools. Mm. Yeah, you can you can find you can find stacks of literature that's saying this this 
this high saying how great it is and what it does. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on the on the flip side, there's also more that says you got to stay away from this. All right. So the first thing that I want to admit out there is that I'm going to say some things and there will be people out there that will say, well, but this study contradicts oh, Dr. Condi. Sure, right? sure. I'm cognizant of that fact. Um, the, the literature and the research is uh, ranges from excellent to pitiful. <laughs> and if you are not looking at it with a very suspicious eye and say, okay, how was this done? Mm-hmm. Who funded it? How were the questions asked? Mm-hmm. Um, what What is the study design? And it it, it can seem like a legitimate, legitimate science, paper, or, science, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, but uh, but not everything out there is on the same tree as far as quality. Uh, there's there was a recent. I, I really like this study, and I, there was a recent study where it, a prominent psychiatrist. I can't remember his name. Um, he took a hundred of some of the most controversial new psychiatric and psychological uh, research that was done. Sure, yeah. Making these claims and said, I'm going to see if I can reproduce it. Um, because the core of the scientific method, obviously, is you, you, you find something and then it's reproducible. And if it's not reproducible, then you got to go back and second guess it. So he and 294 other colleagues took a hundred of these studies, reproduced it in their own labs, their own, and found that only 39 of them were reproducible, which meant that 61% of those studies don't hold merit in regards to being able to be used as a as a, as a legitimate study. An to actual be able, data point. An actual or, data sure, point. sure, yeah. But these studies are never redacted. They're never, they're, once they hit... Google, or once they so hit, it's out there it's in the world, there, regardless, and they're yeah. free to be used to persuade. Okay, so I have to dance a very careful dance that anything that I, I I don't want to be part of the problem. So anything that I talk about either comes with what I think is very very high level of research or my own. This has happened to me, and I cannot deny it. And uh, and there's no nobody else giving me information secondhand. I have seen this. You've seen this when in the kids you've treated, right? Gotcha. Right. Okay. Gotcha. So back to your question. What am, what am I seeing? Um, we the difference the difference between I think my general neurology practice back when I was in Chicago, which was 2005 to 2008. Okay to now is that there are fewer and fewer true neurological problems and more and more psychiatric problems that are masquerading as neurological problems, something we call functional neurological disorders. Okay. Okay. And the other difference that I'm seeing, again, in between that gap, is that when I was doing my general neurology practice in Chicago, it was rare that a preteen would come in on any kind of psychotropic medication. Mm. Very rare. Mm-hmm. Every now and then we would see a 12-year-old on Zoloft or on Prozac, but that was few and far between. And now I came back into it, and I remember my first day back into the general neurology, I asked, why is this 14-year-old on four psychotropic medications? And why yeah. is this 14-year-old yeah. on medications that when I was in training were saved for the most severe inpatient psychiatric conditions like paranoid schizophrenia or severe right. bipolar disorder? I mean, we're talking uh, not only just your Zolofs and your Prozacs, but your Risperidones and your and your Quetiapines and powerful drugs. How pow- abilified? Yeah, powerful drugs. And I'm like, what 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 happened in the five years that I was gone? Right. And so it's a combination of those that shows me that 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 I can't deny that in between those years when I was just living in the ICU, not being exposed to the general neurology in those six short years. There was an acute, undeniable, precipitous change in the number of functional psychiatric neurological disorders that I'm having to see, and the medication of kids as young as 11 and 12 with these, with these powerful psychotropic medications. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now I've I've been at 
a presentation that the two of you, along with some other colleagues, commonly do that saved my family. And so I'm going to pull from that a little bit. You you talk about you've talked about, and I've heard this. Um, you know, kids who develop ticks or things like that that are not or what you just described as, as not being a, a true neurological problem, but a psych- psychotropic psychotropic problem, problem, right? That's the right word, um, yeah. And then also the the brain development that changes. Correct. Um, and so when I went home after this and I'm explaining to my family, like, okay, you actually lose these connections in your brain when you're not using them and when you're on a screen too much and you're not face-to-face. And, um, you know, kids are developing tics and psychological disorders and all these things from too much time on screens, on social media, not engaging with other humans. And th- those are the things you're talking about that you, you saw that huge increase between 2008. Yes, yeah, those, those are the functional neurological functional portions neurological. of it. Right. And that tick, that tick story is fascinating. And I, 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 have, I have watched it from its infancy to where we are now. And, and so I, I, I mean, I can walk you through what happened, but uh, several years ago, so, so Tourette syndrome has been around for centuries. There's historical stories of various, you know, leaders having Tourette syndrome. Mm. And something that is well documented like that has a precedence on we know the cohort that is at risk for developing this. Mm. And it's always younger boys, five to six years old. And um, the way that it tends to start is it's a, it's a motor tick, five or six years old. And sometimes it can progress to a vocal tick and sometimes can be very disabling. Um, and then as they reach, you know, 12 or 13 years old, it tends to peak and then it often gets better by young adulthood. So that, that's, the, that's the group. So I was in my clinic and this mom brings in her 14-year-old daughter who is just doing all of these grotesque ticks, hitting herself in the face and biting her tongue and dropping mm. swear words and and in you know it, and her, the mom said she was fine 2 days ago and now she's doing this never seen anything like that before oh. and so i admitted her i sent her to the hospital i got every mri study i stuck a needle in her back got her spinal fluid sent genetic studies got her entire dna sequence looking for some house episode like rare oh, disorder gosh. that was going to make right. me famous for right. diagnosing right, <laughs> right? yeah because what do you do yeah right. yeah never seen it before everything came back normal and all of a sudden three days later my colleague says i just got the same thing and then two days later my other colleague said i just got another one and then pretty soon we were getting so many referrals for teenage girls with acute explosive onset tourette syndrome we had to hire a nurse practitioner because we were overwhelmed and then we reached out to our other friends and colleagues in other other parts of the country, and they said, we're getting this too. We're getting this too. And after, after about six months where there was enough that people could start doing research on it, they realized it wasn't Tourette's. It wasn't a disorder. It was TikTok. Golly, These girls in their golly. very in their very susceptible developmental years sure. were watching other girls who had Tourette this and seeing the empathy and the sympathy and the support they were getting online and it fed this subconscious oh, limbic system goodness. that they said if i had Tourette's, look how much look how much support i would get look how much people would love me and so then they developed it now it's not volitional that's the thing they're not faking it well some of them are some of them are clearly in there for secondary gain but for the most part they are not faking it but it is not true. Because that would be my that would be my first thing. It's like, oh, they're just faking it. But it's not of their own volition. You're Correct. saying you're saying that it's, there there are literal changes happening in their brain. There are there are literal connections between your subconscious and your limbic system, where it's it feeds into this immature uh, neuro neurodevelopmental part of the brain that says, I need to be sick, because Holy if cow. I'm sick, look at look at all the support the I will get, and so they make themselves sick. They. They oh. don't respond to the Tourette's medications. They don't have any of the functional and, and, and uh, high-end MRI changes that kids with Tourette's have. This is, this is a subconscious. And that happens, not, that happens with seizures. We're getting a lot of epileptic-like movements where it's not seizures. It's the same thing. 
Um, it happens with paralysis, with blindness, and these are what we call functional neurological disorders, mm. and they have just. Well, okay, okay. So this is gonna be this is gonna be jarring, but uh, clearly there's a neurological problem. But you mentioned earlier, um, there there are there are bad people out there wanting to do bad things. What on? I, I know this is a jarring kind of kind of change of segue or whatever, but but what are those people doing out there? So so th- there are neurological problems, the bad guys. For lack of a better term, I'm using air quotes for if you're if you're just listening. But Officer Gomez, what what are what are those people doing, and how are they using social media? So let's talk about TikTok. Let's just continue that one. Yeah. So TikTok is worldwide grooming kids to be worth their body parts, and let's talk about how that happens. So the very first TikTok challenge was the plank challenge. Right. You do the plank challenge from push-up position to plank to push-up to the tune of whatever music they had going on at the time. If you do this, your friends would like it. You get 50 likes, and it's healthy. There's nothing wrong with that. I've got likes. I've got followers. Yay. Now, what the girls discovered very quickly is if they wore a loose-fitting shirt, the camera's looking right down their shirt, and their likes go up to 10,000. If they wear some kind of a sexy bra or get a piercing or a tattoo, now we're in the 500,000. We're getting paid. But in TikTok in general, if people see a... 13, 14 year old girl on TikTok being sexy, instead of reporting it and calling their mom and saying you should have modesty, she gets 500,000 likes. 500,000 adults all over the world, most likely, you know, some of them are kids, but they're liking this 12, obviously 12, 13, 14 year old girl who is bending over in her bikini or being sexy and is like, no, that's not old enough to be sexy. But in everybody else's minds, what they see is you are worth your body parts, right? And the more body you show, the more you get paid. And TikTok now has grown adult women who have kids who join the challenges and show their bare breasts for a second. And they call it the pause challenge where you try and pause it on them walking across a back door that's open. Well, these are grown women who are doing this, showing the kids, hey, it's okay. And they're showing you how much they're getting paid for this. I mean, some of them are making twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month by. So they're monetizing this on TikTok. It's not like a fans only thing or on, whatever. On both, so you you monetize it on TikTok, but you also go to OnlyFans, and a lot of them do advertise their OnlyFans account from TikTok. But on TikTok itself, it's monetized, and you get money depending on how much you can push the envelope because that's where you're going to get your likes and your reshares and your subscribers. Please take time to vote May 21st. The West Ada School District Supplemental Levy will be featured on the ballot and directly impacts the quality of education and safety in our district. The replacement levy funds will sustain the salaries and benefits of 152 current teachers and the services of 19 current school resource officers. It's important to emphasize this levy is not a new tax. It simply replaces an existing levy. If approved, the tax will decrease by 30 cents per $100,000 of taxable assessed value. We've included a link in the show notes so that you can dig into the facts further for yourself. Please take a closer look. We encourage all community members to mark your calendars for May 21st and consider voting to make your voice heard. Every vote counts. So we've talked about some pretty serious dangers already, right? We see this uptick in issues. We see issues on TikTok and the common culprit seems to be the cell phone or the smartphone. So talking about how important it is to get that put away, to get off screen time. Dr. Condi, do you wanna kind of lead in with that? I, I, I'd be happy to, um, because this, there, there, we talked earlier about the different strengths of the research out there, and one of the things that I, that automatically makes for me a study, uh, believable is taking out any subjectivity, right? The, the sure, markers, sure. it's, it's hard to get bias in there when you're looking at objective markers. So I'm going to come back to that in a second. So we've, we've known for a long time that the adolescent period is a very, very susceptible period to be what we call hijacked. There's, there's two parts of your brain that are constantly at play. There is your primitive, emotional, uh, anger, fight, reproduce, procreate, 
just, just your animalistic kind of brains, right? And then there is the a very unique brain uh, that is that is almost exclusive to humans, and that's the prefrontal cortex. Um, the prefrontal cortex, if you look across species, most species have about 3 to 5% of their brain dedicated to the prefrontal cortex. We have 33%. So the prefrontal cortex is what makes us be able to function in complicated situations socially, behaviorally, emotionally, sure. and cognitively. Yeah. It's what makes us not animals. It's what makes right? us not <laughs> animals. It's what makes us... Understand the appreciation of sacrifice and, 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 and working with a problem where there's not a clear right answer initially and, and, and doing all of those things, which is about fully formed when you're 25, but your limbic system is pretty much fully formed when you're six. So the biggest gap between uh, who has the most control is actually adolescence. So during adolescence, you have much more drive from your limbic system and little drive from your prefrontal cortex. And that can set up to where the limbic system can basically override the prefrontal cortex and say, I'm in charge. There's not going to be any human thinking part of you. We're all going to go animal. Mm -hmm. And and you can call that many things, kids that just have explosive rage or road rage. Or there, there's lots of manifestations of it. So there was a study done using uh, using functional MRI, which is a which is a objective, uh, qualifiable and quanti what is quantitatable um, modality. There is mm -hmm. no subjectivity in it. And then what they did is they um, they would expose people to negative tweets on their own own account, and then run them into the functional MRI to see what was going on with the brain. And without exception, when they did that, the limbic system turned on and the prefrontal cortex turned off. They got hijacked, right? And they, they, they then used a test to say, okay, once you've been hijacked, can you still learn? So they took the group and they divided them into two different groups, ones that got neutral responses to their text and ones that got negative responses to their text. And what they found is that, and then they, they did this memorization test, like a Solve, solve a side of a Rubik's Cube or something mm, like that. Mm. And what they found is the, are the ones for up to four hours later, the ones that got the neutral text were able to do the memorized task faster with each attempt. And the ones that got the negative test actually slowed down. So it took them longer four hours later to do the task than it did at the time of showing them how to do it indicating that once you're hijacked, you are unable to learn for at least four hours. Golly. Okay. And that's from Gosh. and that's from responses to a negative tweet. Now imagine you are a 15 year old and you get on your social media account and you find that somebody comes and says, Hey idiot, you are the ugliest clown I've ever no seen. No one ever bullies anyone right? on social media, right? I mean, right. <laughs> come on. And then imagine oh, that hijack oh, happening. Yeah. yeah. So the next four hours you're host. You might as well send that kid home. Yeah. They're, they're not learning anything. They're not learning anything. Yeah. And it's, again, it's not their fault. And we can tell them all the time, okay, just relax, get a hold of yourself. It's not going to happen. It's neurophysiologically not in their, in their wiring to be able to just rebound like that. So second period, someone gets a, 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 a terrible comment about something they are very proud of on their social media account. You might as well send them home. Yeah. So Dave, how are you seeing that manifest itself in schools? Because obviously, I, I would assume that you're seeing evidence of that. Yes. And so what we see is many parents these days are using social media as a co-parent. Oh. Right? As soon as that kid gets home, they're on social media till they go to bed at 3 in the morning. Number right. one, they don't get enough sleep. Number two, when they come to school, they have to be in constant interaction with their phones to see what the latest drama is. And even if you allow phones in between classes, they're going to look at that drama and now they're going to be thinking about that for the rest of the class. Hey, what's going on? What's happening? And if they have it in their pocket and it buzzes, how many kids are going to be able to hold off for 90 minutes or even an hour or two? Wait, they're not. They're going to be thinking, hey. Because that's I, a dopamine hit, right? Yep. That's We've all heard that. That's a dopamine hit. When it, yeah, you feel, feel that buzz of your cell phone, I, I, got, I got to look at it. Even right? adults can't handle themselves on that. Right. So kids definitely can't handle themselves. And if they've spent 10 hours at home since their last class yesterday on social media, now they come to school, 
they're going to be on social media again. They're going to be thinking about social media all day long, and maybe they'll squeeze in a little bit of homework in between. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is that some teachers use it as a carrot. Hey, finish your, uh, your Google packet. Well, because parents use it as a carrot too, right? Everybody uh, uses sorry it Sorry to interrupt carrot. you, but yeah, yeah. And so now teachers do that. Hey, look, finish your Google packet. Now you can be on social media. The teacher has their paperwork graded automatically. But then you get lack of connection between teacher and student. Then why do you even need teachers at that point? But yeah. what we see at the schools with cell phones is kids are face to phone. As soon as we've gotten rid of cell phones in, in a few schools that I've been at, all of a sudden the teachers connect better with the kids, the kids connect better with each other, the kids connect better with everybody else, and you have a better learning, far better learning environment. Whereas I'm telling people now, you can pick cell phones at school or education, you can't have both. Yeah. Oh, well, and that, I mean, what I'm hearing you both say is we need to put the phones away both at home so that your kids aren't up till 3 a.m. on their phones. They should never have their phones in their room, right? Like if there's got to be, I'm trying to find a balance because I don't know. I know Dr. Condi would say no phones for anyone, you know, except for adults. Like absolutely not, right? And I, and I try to think about a balance between responsible use at school, not at school, at home, not at home, during what parameters. How is there is there a happy medium? I think you would argue, Dr. Condi, you would say no. So I don't, it's not, it's not the phones that's the problem, okay? Uh, we have given our daughter, a, a, am I allowed to throw tra- brand names down here? We've been oh, sure, a, that's a, fine. Yeah. You can no, her a no Gab phone. So Gap, G-A-B. A Gab, a Gab yeah. phone. G-A-B. So we can call her and she can call us and we can text her and she can text us and she can listen to music on it, but there is no internet connectivity and there, uh, there are no apps on it. We had a, we had the phones or, or excuse me, watches back in the day for our kids when our kid, when our, when my kids were younger, we did the same thing with those. those. Yeah. Anyway, okay. same, same kind of, same kind of idea. Yeah. But it's the, it's the, the different apps that are out there. Um, that I think are driving the problems. And so whether it's TikTok or Facebook or social media, ones that we've never heard of because they're, they're making money, right? right? The longer our kids use it, they're making money. Oh, sure, sure. All right. So they're going to have a very smart team of designers and psychologists on how to keep them on longer to make money. And we as parents, and, and when you understand how these work in the brain, we as parents ask ourselves, why does my kid spend five hours a day on social media? And as a neurologist, my response is, I wonder why these kids don't spend 24 hours a day because <laughs> that's that's the draw. The like, reward, yeah. yeah we're sure, ask, we're sure. asking ourselves the wrong question. Why are they spending so much time? Where I'm saying, why aren't they spending all their time? Because that's what their brain is wired to do is go get those tiny morsels of dopamine and nor. And, and uh, epinephrine, et cetera, things like that. And very smart people are designing and algorithms yeah. to right. make them do that, right? Exactly. I mean, so okay. much for okay. ethics, yeah. but, you know. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> a joke. So here, here's my argument. For every, every positive thing that somebody has tried to say these apps are good for, there is a negative that far outshines the positive. Mm. I cannot think of anything except for very, very narrow, per, you know, if, if you keep your, your social media down to friends and family only and only use it to, you know, share good news and things like that. But I cannot think of anything where the potential for negativity is less than the positive things that they get. So sure. what, what, do I, what do I mean by that? Well, um, for example, let's take, let's take what I saw. People say, well, social media really helps pe- kids who are isolated feel like they're part of a community. Okay, well, what do I see? I see one of these girls that come up with the functional Tourette's that we were talking about, and they don't feel like their parents and doctors believe them. So then they get on social media to oh. relieve themselves of their social isolation. Sure. And what get, what happens is now instead of taking the right steps to help themselves actually get better they have a whole community of like-minded cohorts who are making them worse Mm. who are feeding into their subconscious Mm. who are telling them how brave they are how great they are don't listen to your doctors it says and they're you know better than they do right so they're getting that so reinforcement there. You might say, community. oh, but sure. they get their community. It's detrimental to them. And the bad community. The bad community. And then the other thing that has been noticed is when you're on a community, especially some of these kids who are quite 
Officer Gomez can probably speak to this better than I can, quite fragile. On average, once you sign in and say something, on average, it takes less than 10 comments before you're being trolled. <laughs> And before there's some psychopath, before human nature kicks in, sadist sure, sure. out there. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and maybe it's human nature, but there are there are these bad people, sadistic people mm -hmm. out there that mm -hmm. get pleasure in in commenting on these fragile kids, knowing that they're going to hurt because of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Less than ten comments later, these kids are going to get a sadistic, psychopathic comment aimed right at them, and those other nine positive ones from there are not going to matter. Right. Yeah, because yeah. they're not going to remember those. They're going to dwell on what this professional sadistic troller is saying about them. Because that's human nature. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I can, example after example. So I, I personally have not found anything where I feel like the positives are so positive that they justify introducing the risks of the negatives because the negatives are so powerful. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, Officer Gomez, I, I mentioned this to you uh, before we started recording, but a few years ago, my son was at Lake Hazel Middle School, and I, being the ego maniacal jerk that I am. I thought, oh, I know everything. I don't need to go. My wife was like, you need to go hear Officer Gomez speak. He's going to give this presentation on social media. I'm like, ah, I don't need to hear that. I, I read all the stuff. I know what's going on. I went, and you scared me so bad I, with all that I didn't know. So given our conversation, what, what do parents not know? Because my sixth grader's doing what? I mean, anyway, there, our kids are finding ways around uh, the parameters we're trying to build for them. What do parents not know? So parents don't understand that kids can get around every single monitoring blockage you put on. Same with school Chromebooks. There's no way for the school to block all the back doors for the Chromebooks. Yeah. The other thing that parents don't know is that there are millions of adults out there waiting for your child to be online so they can talk to them. Mm -hmm. And any adult that is talking to a child, having dialogues with children, I consider a predator. Absolutely. And in an adult's mind, a lot of times they think 30 and 40 year old, but what if it's a 22 year old? What if it's a 25 year old? What if it's a good looking person? What if it's actually a criminal organization talking to your child, trying to sextort them? Right? So. These things have to be taken into account, and most parents don't, are not capable of taking that into account. In fact, very few are. But in the realm of how can we control this, I always, we take in high-risk teens in our house. We take in drug-addicted teens. We take in runaways. We take in all kinds of kids. One of the biggest things we try to do is build self-value into them. Because most kids I ask, hey, what's your values? Well, I don't know. I got this you know, YouTube hit, and I got this other thing. People don't know their values anymore. They're not worth anything, and they don't see anybody that is, so they have nobody to kind of emulate. And so as a parent, hey, number one, you have to be a parent, which is put down your cell phone and be a parent. Mm -hmm. Number two, you have to show them and be the example of what you want. And if they're on the phone the whole time they're in your house, guess what? They're not seeing you. You're not seeing them. You're not being an example. So they are getting their upbringing from TikTok, from Snapchat. And so then I see seventh graders who melt down over politics. When I was in seventh grade, did I know anything about politics? <laughs> I was lucky if I knew who the president was. <laughs> right. Sure. Right. Sure. And there's no way anybody yeah. in my entire school would have cried over a political race. Mm. But yet I have seventh graders. Right. Last time when our secretary of, of schools for the state of Idaho, I had 400 kids walk out of Mountain View crying. And I'm like, well, who was the last person that did this? I don't know. Well, what kind of, what kind of uh, decisions can they make that affect your life? I don't know. I just know it's going to change my whole life forever today. It's never going to be the same. No. Right? Yeah. That didn't happen when we were kids. I had no idea about politics. But you ask me what kind of engine is in somebody's car. Hey, I'll tell you what kind of engine. <laughs> I can change a tire. I could do all that. And so two hours a day is what we tell our kids that come into our house. You get two hours a day, and it counts down on the phone. We use the phone to our advantage. Mm. If they want any more than that, they're going to have to go outside Go talk to the old lady across the street. Go help rake up leaves. Do some community service. Get some human connection and human interaction yeah. so that we know it's happening. If you come home and you don't see your kid until you know the weekend sometime and you spend one or two hours with them a week, you're not raising your kids anymore. Social media is raising your kids. and That's scary. And there's lots and lots of parents doing it, right? Back when I was a parent, I'm still a parent, but when I was a parent of littles, 
we had Barney. You'd put Barney in, you rewind <laughs> yeah. it. I you, love you. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, need to yeah go right. Do Bar- the big purple guy, sure. You do Barney. And it, you know, I still hate Barney songs to this day. <laughs> <laughs> it's still in my brain, as you can see. Yeah. Sure. But it's yeah. not like hooking up Roblox, where you have grown adults who are contacting little kids on Roblox and basically enticing them to be their friends. And those grown adults are going to tell them, hey, your parents don't understand you like I do. My grandma died last week. I really need a good friend. And seven and eight-year-olds have no idea that the eight-year-old character they think they're talking to is actually a 50-year-old man. Mm. And you can look up stories right here in Meridian, talk about enticement. And I've arrested, personally, predators that have come to Meridian to talk with little children. And we see it all the time. Look in the news. We're not even making news of all the people that go to jail. If you look at the jail intake every night... You see lots of them, lewd conduct with a child under 16, right? Felony child enticement. We don't even care on the news anymore. It's just common everyday thing. Okay. So, and I, sorry to interrupt you, but okay. So there are parents who are, who are allowing social media to, to, to raise their kids, but there's also parents who are trying and, and, and there are ways to like, you know, I remember a few years ago I read about, you can hide uh, apps behind a calc, what looks like a calculator, uh, that kind of thing. What's happening there? What, how, for the good parents who are like, I'm doing my best, I'm, I'm monitoring, are, are there workarounds that are, ha- I'm sure there are workarounds that are happening. So even the good parents can get tricked. But if you're a good parent and you're setting the example and you're trying, that's the best you can do. And your kids are going to see that, even if it, they right. don't react to it right away. If they see that, hey, look, my parents are keeping me to two hours a day. They're putting their cell phones in the vault at night to go to sleep just like I am. They're spending time reading with us as a family. We're going out boating. We're going out hiking. We're going out photography. We're spending time as a family team and a family unit. That's going to make all the difference. You don't have to be perfect at that, and you're going to make mistakes. That's okay. But you're showing them the proper things that you think is important, what your family values are. And my favorite thing that a kid ever says is, my family's going to be disappointed in me. Or, in my family, this is how we do things. Right? Those are my... I'm just about to tear up when I see, hear kids say it. And they still do that, right? And they can still do that having social media. But it's got to be a limited social media, not 24-7 social media. Right. And, and kids are also, you know, predators aside, sexual predators aside, there's also um, drug dealers on, on social media, right? Like I hear the kids saying a plug. Like they, they get their drugs from a plug. And like they'll use an emoji, parents, like in their stories. You'll see that, like, right? Things like that you see as well. Yes, so kids can get any drug anytime delivered on Snapchat. Telegram is the latest drug dealing application, Mm -hmm. and it's super easy, uh, very convenient. A lot of them are using crypto, so they can't be tracked. Join us this summer for the West Ada Enrollment Fair. Únase a nosotros este verano para la Feria de Inscripciones al Distrito Escolar de West Ada. Mark your calendars for Monday, July 29th. The fair will run from 8 a.m. until 7.30 p.m. that day. Marque su calendario para el lunes 29 de julio. La feria se realizará desde las 8 hasta las 7 y media de la noche ese día. You'll have the chance to learn about enrollment procedures, understand the process, any required documentation and deadlines, or any other special requirements. Tendrá la oportunidad de aprender sobre el proceso de inscripción, presentar cualquier documento que se necesite, y conocer los plazos requeridos. We want you to be able to prepare this summer for the upcoming school year. Queremos que te prepares este verano para el próximo ciclo escolar. There's a lot of information to digest. To help, we've included a link in the show notes. Click there for everything you need to know. Hay mucha información que digerir y para ayudarte hemos incluido un enlace en las notas del programa. Haga clic ahí para todo lo que necesitas saber. Well, it seems we've had a lot of information here between the two of you. And so I'm thinking Ken and I always put on our parent hats during a during a podcast. And how can we go back and practically implement this kind of thing? What are some limits? And um, something we've been talking about a lot, Lee, Lee, too, are is screen are all screens considered equal? Is TV time the same as social media time and things like that? So what are some practical limits. Um, Officer Gomez, you mentioned earlier, you know, the kids in your home get two hours, but is there an age requirement, that kind of thing? Yeah. So I always tell parents the minimum age for any kind of social media is 13. 
Okay. And the FCC actually requires that because they don't want companies selling your child's data to everybody. Okay. Right. So right. 13 is the minimum. 16 is better. 18 is best. And people say, well, my, my kid's going to be an idiot on social media if they're 18. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Yeah, maybe they won't care about it and not right? even dive in, right? The longer yeah. you wait for social media, the, the more activities, the more boredom your child is going to have, the more skills they're going to learn. And what I see is the sixth grader who comes to school with their guitar every single day, they come to school with their sketch pad, they come to school with whatever, as soon as they get a phone in eighth grade, no Done. more guitar, no mm -hmm. more photography, no more anything. The longer you wait, the better. And if you wait till 18, now that child at least has had an understanding of a life without screens. Yeah. Because if not, that is going to be their life. And we're running into a lot of adults now who that is their entire life is their screens. And, you know, when I take people to jail, and I do take people to jail every once in a while, the number one request from everybody is, can we stop and smoke? Because they know they're not going to smoke in jail. Mm -hmm. But now, several times now, when I'm taking young women or even juvenile females is, can you give somebody my username and password to my Snapchat so they can continue my streaks? Because I don't want to lose my three years no. worth of streaks. Uh, that is that is their primary concern on the way to jail. On their way to jail that they're going to lose their Snapchat streaks. Because some of them have three years worth of Snapchat streaks. This is an addiction. A addiction, you know, my simple term is giving up everything for one thing. Yeah. The longer you wait, the better. Because if you give up everything for Snapchat, you give up everything for TikTok, for Instagram, that is an addiction. And I see kids that will melt down. And I have parents call 911 because they turned off Fortnite mid-game. And now the child is breaking windows. Or they took away their Roblox before the, the kid was ready. They're breaking windows. They're coming after. The longer you can wait, the better. The more real life they will get to experience. But yeah. 13 is the minimum. Unfortunately, most fifth graders have Snapchat already. Well, and that's, you say, t turning off the Roblox, taking the screen time away, and the kids are freaking out. That's the animal part of their brain that you were yeah, talking about, right? Yeah, and I can right? back that up. I mean, I'm, I'm, you can't, probably can't see, but I'm 6'3", 220 pounds, and I'm, and I'm not a small stature. I'm old, but I'm not small. <laughs> um, I've had 11-year-old boys that maybe weigh 80 pounds soaking wet in my clinic visit when I've told the parents that I think that the majority of their neurological problems are related to the fact that they're not sleeping because they're playing video games until 2 o'clock at night mm -hmm. and that I wasn't going to do anything further until they took a four-week fast, a complete four-week fast of the video games and got a good night's sleep. And then if there was something still residually a problem, we'd, we'd just, that, that's, a, that's a practice that I take when it's clear. I've had 8, 9, 10, 11-year-old boys that I outweigh by 150 pounds start swinging at me for the fences <laughs> where I'm holding them back with one hand and, and they, they want, and they're losing it. They, they've lost it. <sighs> right? right. Past tense. Sure. I mean, yeah. talk, oh, talk about a, if a species is supposed to have self survivability at the, the root of it, talk about losing that. Right. Because if this were in the wild, you don't, you don't attack somebody that, clearly physically will dominate you, but that's right. not even on their mind. They have, they have lost their perception of reality so much when that video game has been taken away from them that they're going to go after yeah. me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that it's not only them breaking windows and, and things at home, it's they're, they're, they're and trying. It's, be, it's beyond the parents. I would imagine when you're saying this and they're, they clearly have no rational reasoning. You other parents, you want to look at them and be like, get control of your kids. But it sounds like they very it's beyond these parents help yeah, yeah. control. At, at that point, that's the hijack. And yeah. once you're hijacked, you you are hijacked. Well, and there's there there okay. So I, before we leave today, I, I really want to positive note is not the right way to say this, but there there are resources. Can you all talk a little bit? We've talked briefly about Save My Family. Oh, Can yeah. you talk about what that is? Uh, and Officer Gomez, I know you're all over social media. Uh, and I'm, I want to put some links into our show notes of, of okay, here are some practical steps that, that parents can take. But but save my family for either one of you. What are, what are you doing there and why are you doing it? So we talk about and save my family. It's a group of us. And sometimes you get a set of four. Sometimes you get a different set of four. Myself, Dr. Condi. We have Kelly Rich, who's who's a nurse, has some excellent family building recommendations. Yeah. Um, we have Agent Hart. Um, who's now Chief Hart in Caldwell, 
he talks FBI about, agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He talks yeah. about some of his FBI experiences. But at the end, we don't want to just depress parents and say, well, you know, <laughs> right. I hate this. You know, my, my kids have no chance. We also give a lot of tools. Hey, here's some things you can do, small steps that are easy that everybody can handle. You know, you're talking about the parents that have lost control. They got themselves in that situation. And right. it's just beyond their tool set, not beyond control. It's just beyond their tool set because I can go to a house and handle any child. So can a lot of my partners after we teach them how, you know, and you can do it without pepper spray. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Right. Just as Dr. Sure. Connie can handle things. But a lot of it starts with let's let's get rid of the screens. Let's go back to some basic parenting. Let's go back to some easy things that are easy. to, And some of them are fun. Parenting can be absolutely fun to spend time with your kids, to watch them grow, to watch them, you know, build their little characters. You know, it's, it's way better than them throwing a, you know, a bowl at you because you turned off their Fortnite. Right. <laughs> and, and here's a terrifying, I mean, if, if you're at all a parent, I'm, I'm taking off my doctor's statistics now and talking about parents. This is a terrifying s- statistic. By the time your child is 12, you will have spent 75% of the time you will get to spend with them in your life. Wow. And that is a daunting that, statistic. That is, sure. as somebody who has a 12-year-old, uh, that is very surreal to me to think that the majority of the time that I'm going to spend with her is already passed. It yeah. hurts. I am so grateful that that time was not wasted with her in her room day after day after day not interacting with us. If, that, if somebody had told me, oh, hey, your daughter's 12, you've already spent 75% of the time with her that you're going to spend. And I look back and think, I haven't spent any time with her because she's uh-huh. being re- I can't think of a greater abyss of, de- of depression that I could feel at that time than to realize I've lost all that. So, yeah, next time, next time you think, oh, I'm going to let my 10-year-old spend all day on Fortnite, next time, just remember, you're two, you're two, you're two years away from, from now only having 25% of the time you're ever going to spend with them again in front of you. Well, this is probably an unanswerable question, but I mean, I remember years ago when my kids were littles uh, at CN Elementary, I'd go pick them up after school and I would notice, uh, to your point, Officer Gomez, all the adults, all the adults are like this, you know, looking down at their cell phone. And I'm like, nobody wants to talk to me, <laughs> you know, but, but uh, I, think, I think the point I'm trying to make is, what do we do as adults? How do, how do we change our behavior? You, t- you, you both talked about parents modeling their behavior. What do we need to do as adults to, uh, to shift this and change this? Officer Gomez, you want to start? Yes. S- start being an example of family values. Hey, in this family, we do honor. We do integrity. We do family outings. We support each other as a family. We support each other as a community. And we build on those things. You can't do that with your face and a phone. Yeah. Right? So, you know, one of my, you know, the late Colin Cartner used to say 98% of parenting is put your own phone down. <laughs> Right. And let kids be bored because when they're bored, that's when they're going to learn what they can do, what they're good at. I ask kids what they're good at these days. Hey, what are you good at? They have no idea. They've never been off their cell phone. And they say, well, I can't learn. I can't learn. But yet you put a PlayStation controller in their hand and they can learn how to do Do all kinds of things. You take away their Wi-Fi, they become geniuses in two seconds. They are capable. We as parents and as communities, we have to start letting them be kids again. They're not kids, they're robots on social media. And that's why we're trying to help, you know, school systems. Hey, look, you can't have cell phones in school anymore. Yes, we tried it. Yes, it was fine during COVID. We, we got to take back our schools. Just like I uh, just heard of somebody talk, take back the dinner table. Yeah. How many families eat dinner to, together without cell phones? Same thing goes for school. Let's take back our schools. Let's learn, the, you know, the four R's instead of, you know, all the weird things that are going on in politics. Let, let's get back to the four R's. You get some, give me a kid with four R's, and they're going to be awesome. Yeah. Well, so bottom line, no, uh, no, uh, no cell phones at night. Uh, no cell phones have at the dinner, table. No cell phones at the table. Uh, practical steps from your I, – I didn't let, give you a chance to answer, Dr. Condi, but practical steps that, that adults need to be doing. So everything that Officer Gomez just said, I, I fully support. I, <clears throat> I, I also think that adults with the kids, the parents with their kids – should make an active effort to go out there and find like-minded adults to help their kids have other children to relate to that aren't relating to them over social media. Last Save My Family that I did, I got a a critique from an audience member um, where he said, well, yeah, but if I don't let my daughter have her social media, then her friends will make fun of her. 
And he was dead serious about that, that the, the fear of being bullied for not having social media, the fear of being bullied for wanting to do real life instead of virtual life was his validation for saying, well, she needs social media so her friends don't make fun of her. Go, so parents need to find like-minded families. They're out there. Right. The more we do right. this, the, the more I realize it's not a small percentage of families that understand this. And they, they, need to, they do need to form their own subgroups as far as I'm. They need to have so that, hey, if we're coming. My, my daughter or my son's having a birthday party. Leave your cell phones at home. Yeah. If they bring their phone to my party, it will be confiscated until after the party. And encourage other parents in radical your idea, group right? Group <laughs> yeah. to do the same. Because I almost dropped a bad word. <laughs> um, half measures, the, the, the juggernaut that we are against is so powerful and so integrated into uh, entertainment and politics and trillion dollars industries, right? You try and do a half measure against an animal like that, you're going to get slaughtered. That's, I guess that's my take, is we are not against, or we are not going against, and we're not fighting against an industry that cares about our children. Right. That's the right. first thing that you have to understand is they don't care. They are full of, they are literally full of sadists and psychopaths who are just trying to make money and trying to organize. So once you realize that they don't care, and then you take the second step to realize these actually don't mind harming, and they're this powerful internationally, I, I just don't see the wiggle room for half measures. Yeah. Well, and I and I, I'm not I'm not pushing back on you. That's not that's not the right way. But our, our as a parent, I think sometimes there, I'd like to, I like to allow my kids to make mistakes so that they can learn. Are there mistakes that we can let them make in this realm that will help them to learn, or is that just too dangerous, too dumb? So, for lack of a better term, I'm going to jump in. You can jump in. <clears throat> kids need to make mistakes. They need to make a lot of mistakes. They need to get hurt. They need to understand cause. They need to make a lot. Skin knees are okay. Exactly. Sure. sure. So, you know, one of my best, one of the best descriptors of, of sports that I've heard that I really like is sports give kids an avenue to learn very, very important lessons in something that itself is really not that important, right? 100%, 100%, um, sure. And so, and, and, and failing at school and failing in, and making mistakes in, in performances, the difference there is when they make a mistake, they're usually surrounded by coaches, teachers, and parents who are there to protect them. On these platforms, if they make a mistake, they're surrounded by predators mm -hmm. who are whose job it is is going to pull them deeper into that mistake. So yeah. the chance that if they make mistakes in the internet, social media world will get them into a positive feedback loop where they can no longer come out I, I don't know if I want to take that chance. I hear it. I hear it. Officer Gomez, your thoughts? Yep. And some of these mistakes the kids are making are felonies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Right? So you get, you get kids that share their nude photos at school. And this is happening a lot, a lot, a lot. They share their nude photo. That's a misdemeanor first time, felony the second time. You get an 11th grade boy who has a picture of an 8th grade girl in his phone. That's a felony right away. Yep. And I, it's, it's, I'm, I'm sh ashamed to admit that I don't think that way, but I have, obviously that stuff is happening. Yep. Yeah. So those are the mistakes that you, you have a hard time bouncing back from. But the felony part is nothing. If you get a 10th grade girl who sends out a nude photo, it gets shared. Now for the rest of the, her life, she's going to be contacted by random strangers who are going to say, hey, I see you're getting married. What's it worth to you if I don't share your naked picture with your wedding party? I see right. you're getting this new job. What's it worth to you if I don't share this with your church, with your family, with your friends? So the blackmail. Yep. And so a naked picture sent out in 10th grade, in 9th grade, in 8th grade can last the rest of your life. So what, what's a parent to do when um, you, you do have a teenager who has something on Instagram and someone has a picture? Or maybe they haven't even, maybe they've superimposed, right? Like AI is a thing. Oh, um, sure. And they're trying to extort money out of your kid. Like if you don't do this for me, XYZ, I'm going to send it to everyone. Do you just delete that app and like 
your profile, you don't have that anymore. What do you do? Do you reach out to the SRO? What, what are the call op- police right away and they will call the SRO. They'll come handle it. We can always make those things stop. It's like when, yeah. when my kids, even up in Idaho city, they barely have electricity and running water <laughs> and they still get these extortion schemes. Right. But I tell them I'll make it stop because I'll contact Snapchat. We'll shut down the IP address. Can I arrest them? No, because some of these are criminal organizations in Africa that are right. sextorting elementary kids in the United States. Contact the police because this is a problem that can last the rest of their life and you need the resources. Hey, because yeah. we're going to handle it today. You're going to have to handle this again in a year, in five yeah. years, in 10 years. I had a young lady at Mountain View who followed me from Lewis and Clark Middle School. She, her picture went out in middle school. We had to deal with that picture maybe once or twice a year for the entire high school career. So oh, police gosh. are your friends. Parents, don't be afraid. SROs are here to help you. No. Local police are here to help you. You're not, it may be embarrassing. Your kid's going to be embarrassed, but guess what? That's where you learn, right? You learn your lesson, but mm-hmm. ask for help because you can't sweep it under the yes, rug. Yes, and I tell all the kids at school, look, the bigger the mistake, the better friend your parents are, the better friend your police yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I can't even thank you both enough. This is such an important conversation. So I, I we appreciate your time. I think before we leave, though, what have we not covered? Any, any final thoughts that, that you all want to, uh, to put out there for our parents and our families and maybe our teachers as well? Uh, before we say goodbye, any final thoughts that we haven't covered? Dr. Condi? I have a final thought because it's uh, currently going on in the news right now, so it's a current event. Um, as we all know, Florida is patting themselves on the back because they just passed this bill that said, look at, look at what we did. Um, now it's going to be impossible for kids under 13 to be on social media, and, we're, we're, and, and it's great. Please don't understand me that I am not in favor of that. But number one, look how long it took some sort of governmental agency to act. Mm -hmm. And number two, their act is grossly, grossly incomplete. Mm -hmm. Uh, 13 is not is not old enough. I don't know why they didn't extend it to 16 or 18. Right. Mm And I don't think they addressed all the ways around it. Like that's just like saying, oh, well, 13 year olds aren't allowed to vape. Well, they're not going to Eagle Middle School and see how many 13 year olds are vaping, right? <laughs> right. There's, there's gonna be sure. ways around it. So sure. <clears throat> my take home is if you're waiting for the government to protect you and your kids from this, if you're waiting for policies from the institutions to outsmart these very dynamic, ever changing <laughs> companies that literally change from day to day, if not month to month, whereas the government you know, is year to year to decade to decade, stop waiting. It's not going to come from the government. There is not going to be protection for you or your family or your kids from the government. And if they do, it's going to be inadequate and too late. So you got to be proactive and you got to say, okay, this is on me. This is on me as the parents. It starts in my house. It starts starts in in my my house house and it starts in my community. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I would say the same thing. Intentional parental decisions is what's going to save your family. And it's not even that hard. Spend some time with your kids. Look them, face and, look them yep. face-to-face every day. Have dinner with your kids. Talk yep. to them. Have some fun. You know, I work on the, on the lake at Lucky Peak a couple times during the summer. Rough life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rough life for you. Yeah, yeah. I love but it. But I see kids that come in on the boats, and they bring their, their friends, and they have a blast all day, and there's no cell service there. Yeah. They just And not everybody can afford a boat, but just an example – they have a blast. I see kids that come up in Idaho City and they go hiking. They spend the weekend with their family with no cell service. You know, they're painting rocks and they're making little bows and arrows and they're, you know, yeah. going on river adventures. Just, you know, right there, this six, seven-year-olds, right? Go snake hunt, whatever they do. Promise you that that is going to be life lasting more than something cool on social media. I have the guts to live in the real world. Yep, it yeah. can be done. Lots of parents do it. It's not that hard. You just have to be an intentional parent. Love it. Very Love good. it. Yeah. Intentional parenting. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And I know our parents do too. So thank you for being here. Can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you for Thanks ha- for having us. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for being here today and for being such a, a part of, a, of an important conversation. It almost feels a little anticlimactic, but, but we, we all the normal things we talk about. I, we would love for you to subscribe uh, wherever you listen to your podcast. Please take a moment to, to su- subscribe and leave us a review. You can watch us on YouTube. And we're doing something a little bit different uh, here with this episode as well. Uh, our email address, communicate at westada.org. But there's a specific question we want to ask you today. How do you manage social media in your house. And I think one of the things that we heard today was it starts in our houses. So yeah. we would love to hear from you and, and, and to be a community together. 
uh, talk to us on social media. Talk to us again at that website or the email address. How do you manage uh, social media in your house? Because I think we need to be a community and we need we to do. do this together. Well, it's imperative, right? Our kids are at stake. Their yeah. future is at stake. We need to um, work together, be parents, make the hard choices and, and help each other out. You know, we share some ideas of how we manage things in this conversation. Right, but, right. Um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners have some good ideas too. So again, thank you for being here. Next up, we get to have kind of a end of the year wrap yeah, up with Dr. Yeah, Bub. So yeah. that'll be really good to hear all the things going on in West Data, the good um, and what we're focusing on for the future. So that's sure to be a great conversation it'll be in a great June. Con- yeah, it'll be a great conversation then. And uh, and uh, again, we would love to hear from you. And uh, and, and let's, let's don't do this alone. Let's do this together. Let's yeah, be a community. Right. So yeah. thank you to Dr. Condi and Officer Gomez for being here today. And thank you to you for listening. Have a great day.